The following episode of the Maui Chamber of Commerce's Business Matters was originally broadcast on January 3rd, 2023. Time now for Business Matters with your host, Pam Tumpop. Good morning, Pam. Hey, good morning, Gary. Happy New Year to you and to all of our listeners uh, who are joining us this morning for Business Matters radio show sponsored by Mokulele Airlines. Um, I'm your host, Pamela Tumpop, president of the Maui Chamber of Commerce, and we're thrilled to be off with an exciting start to 2023 with a new mayor, uh, who had his inaugural party last night, Mayor Richard Bisson, as well as uh, Tasha Kama, who is now our interim council chair for the Maui County Council. So we are so thrilled to start off the new year with great leadership. And today we're going to talk about that. We have Speaker Scott Psyche, uh, who is with the State House of Representatives, and we're going to talk about the coming legislative session. We've got Tony Davis from the Activities and Attractions Association of Hawaii, and we've got a chamber member who's helping companies with their IT this year, as well as marketing their company and sharing their message. But we're going to begin this morning with Representative Scott Slyke. He currently serves as the representative for House District 26, which includes the areas of Macaulay, Kaheka, uh, Kaka'ako, and downtown. He is a speaker of the House of Representatives, and he was first selected to the House of Representatives in 1994 and took on the leadership role of House Speaker in 2018. He also led uh, the resolution and the committee called the House Select Committee on COVID-19 Economic and Financial Preparedness to work with representatives from local and state government, private industry, and nonprofit agencies and organizations to inform the House of Representatives and not just the House of Representatives, but also uh, the uh, Senate as well as the governor on the state's economic and financial preparedness efforts uh, as we address the COVID-19 outbreak. So he has done a lot of work during this pandemic, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Speaker Psyche to join us this morning. Good morning, Speaker Psyche. How are you? Hey, good morning, Tom. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I know you have had so much on your plate, both during the pandemic, uh, last year's legislative session, and, you know, that was a time when we were kind of reuniting and coming back as we we were watching COVID uh, become more normalized. We won't say uh, left us <laughs> since we're still addressing it, but um, I know that you're ramping up with new priorities for the 2023 legislative session. Could you tell us about some of the key issues that you're focused on this year? Sure, Pam. Um, so, you know, thanks for having me this morning. Um, and speaking of the pandemic, I was just, the other day I was trying to think through the timeline of the pandemic because I just, I just lost track of the years, you know, the last yes. couple of years. And the shutdown um, occurred in March 2020. Uh, which you know, which was almost three years ago. So it's just time just just went by so quickly, and um, um, you know, so this year the legislature will begin will uh, begin our regular session on Wednesday, January 18, and um, we're you know scheduled to end in early May. The the Session is going to be interesting because we have um, an influx of new House members this year. We will have at least 17 new House members um, from you know throughout the state, and uh, which is the most the most the largest freshman class that we've had in 30 years. Wow, and, that's great! Right. Um, yeah, so it's going to be exciting. We have a new leadership team this year in the House. So you know, I'll return as Speaker, assuming that I'm voted in. On January 18, but uh, uh, you know what's interesting to note is that our House leadership team is pretty dominated by the neighbor islands. So uh, we have a Vice Speaker, Majority Leader, a House Majority Floor Leader. All three are neighbor island 
representatives, um, our three uh, top committees, finance, judiciary, consumer protection, will be chaired by Neighbor Island members. So I don't know if found any uh, leadership in this, but uh, you know, I'm looking forward to working with all of the members. Um, I think it's going to be a very positive session. Um, we're coming into the year with the budget surplus, and unfortunately, um, we'll also be working on some carryover issues from last year. You know, sometimes we House members themselves forget what we approved last the year before. Uh, but what I wanted to do was to bring some of these topics back because they are going to require some oversight and implementation, and these include the appropriation of $600 million for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Uh, we want to make sure that there's a, a, a plan in place to provide more housing for Hawaiian Homeland beneficiaries. We also have uh, a, we appropriated $150 million for affordable housing uh, for those who are in the lowest, lowest uh, income brackets. Um, and we also want to um, see how our funds are being spent on the pre-K program that we appropriated last year. So there's some there, there's some big buckets, and big topics that we need to continue to work on over the next year, and I know that there'll be a lot of new initiatives as well. Yeah, it you know we are dealing with so many critical issues. The good news is surplus, <laughs> um, which is you know I I know that uh, again during these times we were trying to keep everything uh, in place and where families and businesses were protected and and having to uh, contribute at ways that didn't take so much out of their households and out of their business. But it's nice that we can go into this session while we've got huge priorities and look at what we can do to really streamline this. I'm really excited about the Department of Hawaiian Homelands money in that um, we've seen some of their plans, and we've been really excited to see kind of how they're looking at things holistically and looking at not just, you know, yes, definitely um, Hawaiian homelands housing, but also looking at it broader and creating some structural systems. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you're feeling about uh, their plan? And that, you know, it is a lot of money to move forward with housing. So how are you feeling about that plan and actually getting housing built? Because that's such a critical priority for us all. And of course, and then I also want to jump back in on housing, as you mentioned, for the lowest AMI levels. But with the Hawaiian homelands, huge influx of, of um, available funds, we see this as a, a great jump starter. Yeah, you know, I've always felt that um, if we are able to address the uh, Hawaiian Homelands waiting list and provide housing for the people, beneficiaries who are on the waiting list, that that would take a, a chunk of the, um, address a chunk of the demand for affordable housing in our state. Um, so it's really, this is really a top pr priority for us. We, the House wants to work very closely with the department on implementing a plan. The department did submit a preliminary plan to us uh, a few weeks ago. Um, you know, we're in the process of evaluating that 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 plan. Um, you know, what we want to encourage the department to do is to focus on a couple of areas. One is to see how they can leverage the funds that we provided to them, rather than just spend down the funds. How can they use those funds to bring in additional funding or financing that would stretch stretch the dollars um, over time? and to provide more housing. Um, we also want the department to focus on different forms of housing as opposed to the traditional uh, homestead that the department has focused on in the past. I think that the beneficiaries themselves, some of the beneficiaries want alternatives. So they don't want a homestead. They want maybe, they may even want a, a uh, an a, a apartment or con, a, con, con, a condo unit. Mm -hmm. You may not want a single-family home. I mean, you have different kinds of, you know, you can imagine the waiting list at HHL, the demographics probably kind of reflect some of the kind of the needs of the larger community, the broad community. And yeah. it's very so it's very diverse. But the department needs to think creatively, creatively about 
helped out and be somewhat innovative on how they want to address different needs. Um, but I think, as I mentioned earlier, one of the main points is that the department needs to see how it can leverage the funds that we provide so they can maximize the use of those dollars. I I got to see uh, the draft version of the plan, and we we felt that they were doing some great things to look at how to leverage the funds. And as you point out, we have so many people who have been on the waiting list for housing for so long, uh, both in older generations and then, of course, you've got younger generations. So I, I like the idea of really looking at diversity of the housing that they're looking to present and uh, providing more options. So I, I, yeah. I thought it was a, a, good, a pretty good plan. I, I, I'll be curious to see the the uh, feedback that it continues to receive. But we were excited on Maui to see that and also their their interest in finding other partners and helping and working with other groups as they look to roll out their plans. And that was exciting as well. Yeah, absolutely. The the, the Department of Fine Homelands, you know, they can't they can't do it themselves. They're gonna they're gonna have to rely on um, on resources outside of the department, um, both in the public and nonprofit sector. So, I, I think that uh, you know, hopefully the uh, with with the uh, you know the the governor has appointed uh, a new director for Hawaiian Homelands, um, who subject who still needs to be confirmed by the Senate. But hopefully this new administration can help, you know, set the set the direction and the tone for some innovative ways to deal with this. Yeah, this this is a this is an exciting time. And I, I also appreciated you mentioning that again housing is so critical statewide and of course it's it's a huge issue on Maui. We've been championing housing for years, um, but housing is on par with economic development <laughs> and the strength of the economy and sustainability for the Maui Chamber of Commerce because of the crisis state that we continue to be in. Tell us a little bit about you know, your programs to address housing on, on a broader level and, again, to, to continue to look at how we get housing for the lowest AMI levels. Yeah, so I, you know, I kind of point to an example um, in my in my district in uh, in the uh, Kakako district. Um, in May, we opened um, the state completed a, a high rise rental building on Piikoi Street. And uh -huh. um, if, if anyone has driven down Piikoi recently, you probably noticed the new building right next to the Sheridan Park. And um, this is a uh, it's a four-story building. Three of the floors are set aside for, or a section of it is set aside for the judiciary. The judiciary has some offices there. But ah. there's approximately 200 um, families that rent uh, in this building. It's an 80% and below AMI building. It was um, financed through the state, through the whole, uh, Housing Finance Development Corporation, HHFDC, uh, which is going to serve the uh, tax, you know, tax credits um, and the rental housing trust fund. And um, but this building, you know, this project started. I started working on this eight years ago. Wow. Eight years ago, and it just required so much coordination. Um, and you know, HFDC was able to pull it off. Um, the Kobayashi Group was the, was a developer selected as the developer for this building. The Kobashi Group is going to continue to manage the building now that it's open. Um, but it's just an it's an example of the kind of project I think that the state should try to replicate in other areas. Um, um, and uh, you know because it it, just, it squarely addresses those in the lower the lower AMI category. You know, one of the things I would love to see, and I really appreciate you sharing this model, is I would love to see um, some sort of coordination of models across the state. What are some of the best of the best examples of what can be done? And, of course, um, I, I love this idea of also how you paired 
you know, a, a judiciary and a state agency with some space in there, you know, commercial space with apartment space, looking at new models where we make these things pencil out. Of course, I don't think we'll, on Maui we're going to get um, such a high rise. <laughs> right, right. We we don't go that high, but, but a, right. that's a big issue here, right, which is looking at the importance of going more vertical as we have such a housing crisis and then looking at density and, and we also spend a lot of time looking at infill projects. So, you know, I'd love to see coordination where we've got some of the best of the best examples and best practices statewide. Well, the other thing here, and I know it's also a county issue that Mayor Bisson is committed to addressing, um, and, you know, with uh, our new governor, Josh Green, saying he's, housing is one of his top priorities and our mayor saying the same thing. It seems like this is a great time for movement, um, both right. looking at systems at the state level uh, to, that we can expedite to address the crisis as well as county levels. So um, yeah. I, I know that that's on your on your priority list as well. And can I do a shout out because the, our new housing chair, committee chair is from Maui, Representative Troy Hashimoto. Uh, he served as the vice chair the last two years, and um, he will now be chairing the committee. And I'm, you know, I'm just really excited about that because the last two years Troy worked so hard as a member of the housing committee, and he took on some he took on some big, complex uh, issues such as the such as the um, mediation program during the pandemic for um, yeah. people who were being evicted from their homes. Um, he he worked so hard on these on these initiatives, and I have. I think you guys do a great job as the housing chair. We are very excited about that. Um, at the Maui Chamber of Commerce, we're working with Council Member Tasha Kama, and, and some interesting things have emerged, and one of the things you may have heard about is we've created a parking lot for people who are sleeping um, individually or with children in cars that are getting ticketed or moved at night, and people are just exhausted, and many of them are working families but they just can't afford housing. So we've looked at a parking lot where we could put uh, a place for them to, to sleep and use the restrooms, uh, but be undisturbed overnight. But if we can do that, we can at least give them sheds, and we can at least give them a roof over their head and a place to stretch out and not be curled up in their car. So, the, you know, we're, we just have to, we're looking at some pretty serious issues here. And we found solutions looking at our local community, working with businesses, find, working with manufacturers who can create things on island that at least give people some privacy, some decency, and some security that are cheaper than pallet homes we bought before. So it I'm glad the focus is there, both at the state and county level, um, and we're of course thrilled to have Troy <laughs> in that yeah. capacity. Um, he is such a phenomenal representative and, you know, a, a staunch supporter across the state, but of course for Maui County as well, in in just getting things done. And so I think with your leadership and his leadership and uh, the tremendous leadership across the state saying this has to be fixed, we'll get there. Um, I don't want to take too much time because I also want to have you talk a little bit more about the importance of the pre-K program and the work that you're doing there, and especially the importance of this early education now. Um, we, we've got students who are catching up from you know, unfortunately, school closing and things during COVID. And, you know, we know that pre-K programs are such a great jump start. So could you talk a little bit more about that for us as well? Sure. So this is one of the projects that um, you know, Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Luke had worked on while she was in the House, and uh, she'll continue to take the lead on that for the administration. So we'll be working closely with her on this. Um, you know, there was a pretty sizable appropriation for pre-K um, the last in the last year. And um, I think that she's been working really hard to develop the infrastructure um, for a pre-K program, you know, because it requires um, it requires building classrooms, it requires um, training, having staff and training teachers, and it, uh, having a program set up to train teachers. Um, and uh, I, I think that we, I think we'll see in the next year the the some of the building blocks set up to start to implement this to to implement this infra infrastructure. Um, 
But there's, uh, you know, there's different calculations of the number of children who need to require pre-K services. Um, and I think you know, with this budget surplus that we've experienced, you know, last the couple, last couple of years in this coming year, I just the opportunity to build some capital, the capital infrastructure that we've been lacking for for decades. decades. Yes. And pre-K is one of those one of those buckets. I think that that's phenomenal. And I know you're also looking at um, a GET exemption and ethics reform. Yes. So um, the governor did um, you know, did announce that he would like to exempt uh, food and medical services from the GET. Um, that you know we'll, we'll work with the governor on that because tax tax relief is a priority for the house, and the house has always um, taken the approach when it comes to tax relief to to target those who are most uh, vulnerable, those who are most at uh, at need at, at need for for relief. So we'll be working closely with them on that, um, and. Uh, I think that we will have an opportunity to uh, once again target target those who are the at the lowest income levels um, and provide them with some financial relief. I'm excited to hear that. I know that uh, this has been a, a constant issue looking at food and medical and and. You know, we're still in a very tough time. Hopefully, <laughs> we can avoid a recession. Uh, you know, but it's something that we want people watching out for, and want to encourage people to prepare. And again, these are times when, as as things are still a little strained, these are times when we want to check on our savings and continue to to put money aside for a rainy day. But um, I, I'm excited about this year's session, Speaker Psyche. You have really been such an amazing leader, not only in your role as speaker and all of your service over the years, but really in ramping up the House Select Committee and uniting people together in service to be a watchdog and, and be reporting on what was happening during COVID and, and what actions could be taken and working with your colleagues to address critical situations and monitor the funding and look at how we could make a positive difference. And I really want to thank you for all of that. Yeah, thanks, Pam. And you were, you know, you were also a member of our COVID-19 committee, and I remember that you um, you attended all the meetings and you always had questions or comments and ideas. And so you were like a, a critical member of our of our COVID committee. Thank you so much for that. Well, I I really appreciated the opportunity to serve, um, and I thought it was uh, just such an important thing to happen. And you leading that way really kept us. I mean, we we talked about <laughs> a variety of subjects, and, and things were popping up all the time, and, some, and something new was happening. I remember us talking about just even early release of prisoners, and and then impacts that that started to have on homelessness. And, you know, the breadth of the things that we talked about, I think probably most people have no idea, but we were watching things from many different elements and saw amazing things when government, industry, and the nonprofit sector all partnered together to make a difference, and, and you led that effort, and, and it was tremendous. So thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all be there on the 18th, and um, thank you again for your great leadership and update this morning, and we'd love to have you on throughout session as you can. I know it'll be a crazy time, but we'd love to have you give us updates when you're available. Great. Just call me anytime, Pam. Thank you, Speaker Psyche. I absolutely will and appreciate that offer. Thank you, and you have a okay. wonderful day. Yeah. Aloha. Oh, it's always great to speak with Speaker Psyche, and he's he's been on our show before, and we greatly appreciate his updates. We're going to take a brief moment to hear from our sponsor, Mokulele Airlines, and be right back talking with Tony Davis. Mokulele Airlines operates the largest commuter airline hub in the country, right here in Kahului. Fly Mokulele from Kahului to Molokai, Manai, Hana, Waimea, Tona, and now Hilo. Mokulele also operates the only flights between Kapalua and Honolulu. 
There is never a middle seat on Mokulele, and every seat has a window and aisle. Visit MokuleleAirlines.com and take your next flight from the newly renovated Mokulele Terminal. Welcome back to Business Matters. Pam, we have Tony Davis on the line for you. Hey, aloha, Tony, and good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. For those who are listening in, I just want to let you know, Tony Davis is the Executive Director of the Activities and Attractions Association of Hawaii, known as A3H. She has been doing this for the past 25 years. A3H is a trade association made up of all the fun things that people like residents and visitors like to do in Hawaii, air, land, and sea activities. She is also the owner and creator of Pono Res. Hawaii's first web-based reservation system for Hawaii's tours, which launched in 2004. So, Tony, this has been just an amazing time. And, you know, I know we've been looking at, and you served on the Destination Management Action Plan process as well as I, and we're looking at a new time for our visitors and guests and an emergence in our culture. And what are some of the benefits, you know, you've long time talked about managing tourism in a way where we're working with those who are offering permitted tours. Can you talk a little bit about the benefits of visitors using permitted tours and how that helps with our overall destination management? Thanks, Pam. Thanks so much for this opportunity. Yeah, it's um, very um, dear to my heart because to me, you know, when you have a problem, you can address the solutions, but you never really fix it until you address the root problem. Right. And when you know, when you look at anything that you know we're doing, and we're trying to um, be successful at keeping a balance and harmony, you need to have um, things within that that you are able to um, control, right? right. So. <laughs> You know, if we allow our visitors, and it's also, you know, it's not really, we're not stepping up to our kuleana for hosting these um, people that come here, and we're also not, um, you know, our, 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 the other part of our kuleana is to share the aloha spirit, right, and to yes. pass that along to people that come here. I, I look at the visitor industry as this fantastic um export business, right? People make money in another economy, they come here and they spend it, and then they go home, right? But while they're here, if we don't manage their time on this, in this place, you know, they can cause a lot of damage, not only, you know, with the residents, you know, the activities and attractions often get a really big target on their back because the, they're the most um, visible of from the people that live here, uh, the things that people do, right? It, it, it causes the most friction because they're at the beach taking surf lessons, on a hiking trail maybe, um, out on the water on a boat excursion, or, you know, the helicopters flying overhead. Um, if we didn't have controlled tours that were permitted, we wouldn't have that ability to pass on that aloha spirit to those people and, and share the culture while they're experiencing whatever it is they're doing. So while they're up parasailing, we can talk to them about the ahupua'a in uh, the West Maui's, right? We can share that little piece. A lot of times visitors don't know that they want it, but once you give them that, they love it and they cherish it. It becomes part of the highlights of their, their visit while they're here. But if, you know, if we just allow people to go willy-nilly and – rent kayaks, for example, <laughs> and go down to the beach and strap them on their rental cars, however they do that, right? And, you know, it, it, it's a mess. It's a big mess. And there's no way to control that either. With How many activity companies do you think are unpermitted that are operating in that way? And how do we identify who's permitted and who isn't? Um, a big part of that... Um, there, there's quite a bit, uh, depending on what venue of activity that you look at. It seems like the higher the capital required to enter the activity, the specific activity, for example, helicopters. Uh, 
don't think there's any rogue helicopter companies running. Right. There's just way too much capital required to get into that industry, right? But surf school, kayaking, right. you know, um, getting a car that's an SUV and <laughs> taking right. people over to Hana, huge. Uh, yeah. It is just way too easy. Um, and and even with a PUC license, there are things that just, you know, PUC is who issues um, the ability to carry passengers for uh, vehicles. Um, PUC is issued through the state, and you can get a PUC license fairly easy. It's 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 as simple as filling out paperwork, <laughs> and then waiting for it to be issued. Um, but there's no policing then of that activity. Um, right. I've been a big advocate for um, like the Hana tours. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is what we really need to do is lessen the cars, right? So right. the better way to lessen the cars is to really promote those legal tours that take people, you know, 12 people in a van, and small vans, of course, because Hana, the road to Hana cannot accommodate, you know, so it has to be small, intimate tours. But, um, you know, that's like six vehicles off the road. Right, and they're coordinating people's activities, and they're managing people's they activities. They are. They're, they're managing there where well. they go. They're not going, you know, trailblazing off into private property. And the friction then with the residents is lightened, right? They know right. what to do and what not to do. Um, the other part is with rental cars. You know, when I first came here in the 80s, I remember renting a car and being told I could not drive to Hana, that if yep. I drove there and my car broke down, they wouldn't assist me, right? That's right. I used, and, to, I used and, to work in the rental car agency at that time. Oh, <laughs> and I had this thought that why don't we, and the county actually has jurisdiction with the local rental cars, why don't we charge, they have GPS on all those cars now. Why don't we tell them something along that line and say, you know what, if you drive yourself to HANA, there's going to be a fee assessed. Have that money go back to the county and have that money earmarked for um, HANA community. And it, it could be this nice flow of, you know what, if you're going to visit, we're going to charge you, uh, you know, a HANA highway fee um, and have that go back to the community. So it will, it will potentially lessen the people that drive themselves because, to me, that's probably your, your largest issue because they're, they're not in a controlled group like you have with guided tours and, con- you know, controlled and permitted operators. And, and the other side of those commercial permitted operators, commercial has such a bad connotation to it. People always think, oh, they're just making money off this resource. No. If you really go and, and, and go on a, a tour with some of these people, if you live here, you will find that the owners and the people that are running these tours love this place. They are stewards. They're the people who hike in, and when they hike out, their backpack's full of things that they've picked up that are trash that got left behind. They're the people that, you know, are doing the same thing. They're rescuing uh, whales while they're out on their tour, and they see a whale that is entangled with a net, and they report it. Or often, (laughs) actually, with our boats off of Kanapali, they're they are consistently helping swimmers um, that are going out a little bit too far or whatever they may be doing. Um, but they are stewards to this place, and they that's often that's are so overlooked, and they don't, you know, they don't um, really hold themselves up because they are, um, you know, that doesn't look good. So that's part of my job is to be proud of them, and um, that's part of why I love what I do. And, and it started actually on Maui this this uh, organization. It was Activity Owners Association, and it was just on Maui. And um, we expanded statewide in 2002, 2003, somewhere in there, yeah. um, because, you know, they really need a voice, these operators. They're good people. They're people that live here. The money that they make in this tourism, you know, uh, economic cycle, the money that they make stays here. You know, all pretty much tourism employs people locally, right? But with these with these businesses, they are 99% owned and operated by people that own a home here, um, and their kids go to school here. They're residents. They're just like everybody else. So it's um, it gives me, it gives me a lot of um, uh, satisfaction being uh, the executive director of the association. That's why I've done it for so very long. <laughs> Well, you haven't. And when you were saying that, I thought, wow, 
to to know that um, you know it grew over twenty years. It's twenty years now that yeah, you yeah. talked about this growth. I, I mean, that's really phenomenal. And I I really want to encourage people. You know, as locals, we don't take the tourist activities often, or or we do when we have somebody visiting and and we'll join them on an activity. But if you have a chance and you see the work that's being done and you you get to meet the people who are hosting whether it's a a tour to Hana and the stories uh, th- remember the tour to Hana is a long drive yeah. these are educators these are people educating their guests about the history of Maui and the importance and significance of Hana and sharing ways to be Pono. And uh, I mean, it's really amazing. All the way down to, you know, those who are legitimate companies who are not just trying to rent boards at the side of the beach and make a buck, but companies who are training people how to. Uh, surf or they're, you know, if you want to go paddle boarding or whatever the experience is, they're teaching you about our ocean and ocean safety. They're talking to you about Maui. They're talking to you about the importance of uh, surfing to Hawaii and, you know, going through history, Duke Hanamoku and others. Right. I mean, yeah. the storytelling and the experience that they create is what creates these return visitors. Yep. who are people who truly cherish our island and want to keep coming back for that experience. I want to say hallelujah. Pam, you get it. <laughs> you so get it. You know, I've coined the phrase playcation. You yes. know, we say staycation. Yes. So I, I coined the phrase playcation. We actually have kamaaina.org. I don't know if people know, but .org means nonprofit. So um, all our, because we're, we're a 501c6. Um, yes. But kamaaina.org, no Akina, because uh, Internet doesn't recognize that. But you can uh, go there and register for free. You just um, send proof of um, residency with your driver's license uh, via, you know, take a picture with, of it with your phone, send it to us, and we um, authenticate you. And um, A3H members throughout the state are part of that. And it's an easy way for you to book and see what kamaaina rates are. We really encourage them to extend their a Kama'aina rate. Um, I've heard lately hotels now are extending Kama'aina rates again because things have slowed down a little bit, which is encouraging. Well, I've heard on Oahu, like over the holiday, that that happened. Okay, I was going to say, I haven't heard it yet here on Maui. I haven't heard it yet on Maui either. You know, that's another part that I, I share with the visitor industry as well. And of course, it's hard when they've got you know, such uh, high levels of bookings. The demand is huge. To open yeah. it up, but, and the demand is huge. But yeah. giving locals an opportunity to experience the experience that others get to experience, I think, gives them an important perspective that we need moving forward as we manage our visitor industry. I, yeah, I so agree. You, you can't. You know, it's wrong just just in, as human beings going through this life, right? It's wrong to judge and come to a conclusion without having really experienced it and done a little bit of educating yourself on the topic, right? That's that's Absolutely. where prejudice comes in, right? You really you should understand it, experience it, and you will be enlightened. Um you'll understand how special this place is and how special the people are that 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 live here and work here in the tourism industry and why it is so energizing because sharing this place with others it just is um something very very special about it and it it almost feels like it's a something you if you if you're not doing it uh, you know I feel like I I'm letting down this place that I feel so blessed to live in um, and so fortunate. So, I hear you. Me too. Tony, we're going to have to get off and, and let our next guest on, but tell everybody again where they can learn more. Kamaaina.org is for uh, residents, and uh, HawaiiFun.org is for um, local res- uh, for visitors. Maui.org is a page we're working on. If you want to go look at that and give us feedback, I would love it. But... Awesome. Yeah. Well, everybody check it out. 
so many fun activities to do and see. And, Tony, thank you for being such a proponent of better managing our visitor industry, working with legal and licensed uh, activity operators so that we, again, are building a system that is better. We have those levers of control. And I look forward to working with you this legislative session on on great ideas, including looking yeah, at how we do bill. it on a fee. Yeah, so. <laughs> I have a bill. I have a bill, but that's another story. But yes, yeah, wonderful. Well, all right. Well, we'll talk Thanks, again Pam. soon. Thanks yes. a million for joining Thank us. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thank Bye-bye. you. Aloha. All right. It's always great to talk to Tony, and always excited about her ideas and better ways to help our visitor industry and look at ways that we can manage tourism and, and activities in a way that our residents feel more comfortable with. And uh, she is always working on that. Our next guests are going to be Chris Sickles and. Evan Dust, and they are with Maui HD and WCEP. They've been members of the chamber now for uh, since 2017, and uh, they have a business partnership. Chris serves as the president and CEO of WCEP, and I'm going to have them explain this, while Evan is the chief financial officer and chief a marketing officer. They were formed uh, to operate Maui HD as a social media and video consulting firm. They have Maui IT, which is computer support, and they are a reseller of used computer equipment. And HD Pilot is an FAA licensed drone operator. So we are really excited to have them as members of the chamber and working with our community to offer phenomenal and very much needed services, and I'm going to check in with Gary to see if they're on the line. Yes, they are on the line, Pam. Oh, fantastic. Oh, welcome, Chris and Evan. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha, Pam. Great to have you on. Good morning. So let's talk about your, uh, what do you call it, Web, WSEP, or I, I'm just giving every letter in the <laughs> What does WCEP stand for? WCEP uh, LLC is the legal entity, but it does business in three uh, operating divisions, uh, each specializing in a particular area of business uh, service. Uh, as you stated, uh, Maui HD uh, is a social media and video consulting firm. Uh, probably our our most recognized client. We were the uh, social media uh, advertising consultant to council member and now chair uh, Tasha Kama uh, for her. First camp successful campaign uh, for county council and her subsequent campaigns. Uh, we also do work uh, as that company for uh, local businesses and nonprofits, helping them to get their their message out. Uh, either uh, a message of look at the services we offer, or um, look at the things that we're doing in the community, and here's how you can help. Uh, on the IT side, the, the computer side, uh, Maui IT uh, provides support uh, to local, and we also have some, some clients on the continent uh, that we help. Uh, we can uh, diagnose problems remotely. Uh, if need be, we can travel uh, on site uh, to do uh, work on hardware. Uh, we also uh, sell uh, used uh, computer equipment. Uh, we got really into the computer equipment side when uh, COVID broke out and there was this uh, need to connect students with, uh, with the electronic classroom. And uh, many students, uh, you know, parents really didn't have the resources to uh, run out and try to find a, a Chromebook uh, for their uh, students. Uh, we were able to uh, source uh, some refurbished Chromebooks and uh, working with uh, 
then county chair uh, Alex Lee. Uh, we were able to get uh, quite a few Chromebooks donated uh, by our our supplier, uh, so that we could help out families who could not uh, or did not have the financial resources to uh, to buy one uh, for themselves. Well, that was such important work, and I, I appreciate that you've been doing that. It it really is a phenomenal thing. And the other thing is, it, you know, it's going to continue as we're watching another huge segment of the community that, you know, is, is not up on computers. So the IT services paired with the computer services would be really helpful is our seniors. And so much is happening now, really fueled by COVID-19, uh, is telemedicine. And, and people having appointments with their doctors on their computer these days. We've been involved with the uh, Hawaii uh, Hawaii State Rural uh, Health Association. Uh, they have uh, contracted with uh, Maui IT to provide them uh, used equipment uh, that they are distributing uh, throughout the state, uh, primarily to uh, Kapuna. Uh, to provide them a way of connecting with uh, health services without having to travel to uh, their doctor's office. Yeah, that's such a phenomenal program. I, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're working in that area because it's going to be expanding. And for you know parents and uh, who need and can't afford a computer, and for our Kapuna who you know need the services as well as help with affording a computer. It's great to know that you folks are there on the ground here on Maui, <laughs> able to be a resource. And and I do want to do a shout out for your company because you're you're not only uh, refurbishing these computers, but you're selling them at very affordable prices. So I want to encourage our business sector that if you are getting rid of uh, computing equipment. I really want you to think about Maui IT, and uh, there's ways that you can donate used equipment. Um, this is this is a service that they are offering, uh, where the state is has been able to work with them, and the chamber has been able to help promote them, trying to get computers in people's hands for those who simply can't afford them, and and they do an awesome job at doing that, and were a tremendous help during COVID. So I want to give you that shout out and thank you for all that you're doing. Um, I also want to have you focus a little bit more too. I, I, we've got a few minutes to talk about again how you can help people get their messages out and, and how you're working. Um, as you mentioned, your, your top client <laughs> and now Council Chair Tasha Kama is a great example for people to look at and, and see her social media. But how you can work with other local businesses and nonprofits, especially you know a lot of our small businesses, uh, many of whom during COVID started you know expanding their website and social media presences. How can you help them uh, market and promote their businesses? You know, primarily, Pam, uh, probably for most of uh, the social media platforms, video is king. Having uh, some video content uh, on your your company website, on your Facebook page, uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, maybe TikTok. Maybe TikTok. <laughs> yeah, I, I know <laughs> we're we're kind of wary about TikTok because of the uh, privacy concerns that have been yeah. raised. Uh, at the national security level. Uh, but I'll tell you, TikTok gets eyeballs. And oh, absolutely, yeah. When you're talking about getting a message out, you've got to get eyeballs. That's very true. This is yeah. the, <laughs> That's the name of the game, is, is getting that traction. And, yeah, I mean, it's TikTok's been hugely popular, but now we're learning more. And <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see. So, so we're, we're we're wary, but we can work with clients who you know who want to want to have a presence on that platform. Uh, probably the the biggest thing to realize is the electronic electronic media. They're successful 
uh, as an advertising platform because they can deliver a targeted audience that's measurable uh, for a lower cost per impression than traditional uh, advertising media. Uh, you know, if you put uh, an ad in the local newspaper, uh, unfortunately, it, for the number of impressions you get, it's very expensive yes. versus Facebook or Instagram. Uh, television can be a, a good way of getting a message out uh, if you're targeted. We have worked with uh, our local cable provider, uh, Spectrum. Uh, their advertising arm is Spectrum Reach. Uh, and we use that during the campaign uh, for uh, Chair uh, Tama. Uh, and we can do that for, uh, for other businesses. It's, it's a little bit more expensive than doing, uh, than doing Facebook, uh, but uh, certainly it, it's a little bit more multi-generational than, uh, than Facebook, uh, Instagram, or, or TikTok. Facebook is, is trending now a little older. Instagram is sort of the, the middle of the uh, age spectrum, and TikTok obviously Friends, very, very young. Yeah. And radio yeah. advertising, too. Oh, radio <laughs> advertising, yes. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> well, and there's radio advertising as well, but I, I know that you probably help people with messaging on that. Um, I want to have you share, and I just also want to mention that you also do drone footage as well, huge right now, of course, in the real estate industry. And and I, I also wanted to mention that you really, when it comes to the computers, you can help people specify and build a machine to meet their specific custom-built needs. And so that's really awesome. As we're rounding down, I know we're, we're going to have We're about a minute left, to... Pam, about a minute thank left. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, let's, let's have you share with people how they can reach out to you. Um, you can get for Maui HD and HD Pilot. Um, you can call us at 808-495-4442 or for the Maui IT side. Um, if you're having computer problems or you need a new computer, you could call 808-495-4449. Um, awesome. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on the show. To all our guests who are listening this morning, Happy New Year. We want to thank Mokulele Airlines for being our sponsor. And just appreciate uh, all who were on the show this morning and, and greatly appreciate having Chris and Evan as well. We wish you all a beautiful Maui day and great new year. Aloha. Aloha.